ready to go. All right, so um, good morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone, everyone. So today is the last talk for the Math Hub workshop. I want to thank everyone that has attended and that has been looking at the recordings. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce a great collaborator, Dr. Blake Barker, who is an associate professor at Brigham Young University. He will be speaking about solving ODE eigenvalue problems with rigorous computations. So you may go ahead and get started. Thank you, Emmanuel. I appreciate that. So the work I'm talking about today covers a few different projects. And so there are two main ones. The collaborators for one of them is uh, Emmanuel and Christopher Jones and Catherine Simon. And then for the other one, Jared Bronsky, Verher, and Zhao Ying. So I, as mentioned in the title, I'm talking about rigorous computation for obtaining solutions to ODE eigenvalue problems. But I'd like to begin by talking about the motivation, why we would care about that. Primarily, my motivation has to do with problems regarding tipping, tipping being of several different kinds, bifurcation-induced tipping. So the idea here is that you have, say, a traveling wave solution. It's a stationary solution in a certain coordinate frame, in a, a co-moving coordinate frame. And you want to know if this, this traveling wave or stationary solution in the right coordinate frame is a stable solution. That is, if it's perturbed a little bit, will that perturbation evolve with time back to a translate of the original traveling wave? And that is of importance in modeling because in an area, obviously, because if you want to observe a traveling wave, you would expect it to be stable or at least metastable if you're gonna see it in nature. Or if it's unstable, that's interesting because then you can see what happens in the long-term behavior to that perturbation. So that point and parameter space that provides the boundary between stability and stability is, is valuable to know because it represents a location where physically uh, you could expect small perturbations to, to start to lead to very different behavior. Then also noise-induced tipping where you have, say, a ODE that models some physical phenomena and you want to account for small variations in a way that, that you don't really know, uh, you can represent that with Brownian motion to, to uh, account for noise that you don't have a good idea of uh, exactly what's happening. And, um, and so that would be noise-induced tipping. And with noise-induced tipping, uh, oh, sorry, let me back up. Sorry, I should describe this figure first. So this is an example of a traveling wave solution that as a parameter varies, goes from a unstable to stable to unstable regime. So this is for the generalized kuramoto savishinsky equation. These are periodic waves. And the parameter that we're varying is the period. So on this bottom uh, left, so in, in figure A, it's a little hard to see that it's unstable because it, it's sort of a, a small um, instability in a sense, but then you can see in B that it is stable. So you've got a perturbation and then it corrects itself. And so you get modulation, modulated stability. So the um, solution again is close to a periodic solution. And then in C, the instability is quite evident here where you perturb it a little bit. And as time goes on, instead of recovering a nearly periodic solution, you've got what looks like chaos, right? You've got all these. So the, the green and the blue correspond to peaks and troughs of the periodic wave. So you can see that in the right, you get all kinds of peaks and troughs appearing and disappearing. So we'd be interested in the period that goes between these two. Okay, so another motivation is looking at noise-induced tipping. So on, this is... Uh, this is courtesy of Catherine Simon. So on the right here, we've got 
the inverted van der Paul system. So there is a stable, uh, sorry, uh, there is a stable fixed point at zero for the deterministic system. And then you've got an unstable periodic orbit that's given by this black curve. And then what we do is add Brownian motion. So we make it a stochastic ODE and we look at escape. Uh, we're looking for the most probable escape path. So we run lots of simulations and you see these squiggly curves, which are various realizations to the stochastic ODE. And it turns out that you can find the most probable escape path by looking at certain functionals, the Friedland Wenzel functional and the vanishing noise limit, or the Ansager Mashlov functional in the uh, small but, but non zero noise regime. And those will tell you uh, the most probable escape path. And you can show that uh, by finding the minimum of those. So you look for the minimum of these functionals. And one way that you can show you've got a minimum is to consider an eigenvalue problem in order to show that your second variation is positive definite and that you have, uh, that you indeed have a minimum. So that's another area where an OD eigenvalue problem could be of interest. And then uh, another area of interest for developing rigorous numerics are other applications where you could use a functional in order to obtain useful information. One example would be looking at control problems regarding tipping. And uh, the idea here is that you set up a functional whose minimum uh, gives you information th uh, that's valuable. Or, or for example, um, in control problems, you can set your problem up as a variational problem oftentimes. And so you may be interested in finding the minimum. And so that's another area where ODE eigenvalues uh, can be an important problem. So here in this picture, what we're showing is actually an agent-based um, an agent-based model, a stochastic model for wildfire spread. So the different colors here correspond to different vegetation types. This is a project done by a master student that graduated here at BYU last, um, last year. So he was looking at dense trees and grassy areas and uh, areas without vegetation in brown and then water here in blue. And the idea is to see what kind of density of the shrubbery leads to mega fires and which don't. And, and so he's looking at, um, at control problem of removing fuel where these X's are in order to have the greatest effect on preventing a mega fire spread of, of the fire. And another way to look at that is to use a reaction diffusion model for wildfire spread, uh, which a student is doing currently that's working with me, and, and then uh, do optimization problems. So again, these, these uh, problems come up in all sorts of areas where you're interested in, in uh, finding the minimum of a functional or um, finding the stability of a traveling wave. And these turn out to be ODE eigenvalue problems. So there's there a lot of these problems all have a lot in common. So as I mentioned, one way to look at them as is an ODE eigenvalue problem, because you can't solve them explicitly, solving them numerically is the way to go. So numerics are a necessary ingredient to be able to say something. Well, if you're trying to prove a theorem and you want to, to have it completely rigorous, one way to do that is with computer assisted proof. So the idea is that you track all of the errors in your computation, including the, the computer rounding errors via using a computer package, an interval arithmetic package that computes with intervals. It tracks, um, it tracks a bound on your computations for every computation you do. So combining these all together, then you can say with certainty, your computed solution lies within a certain interval, which can be enough to prove something. Okay, so how, um, just a little bit more on motivation. 
with these bifurcation problems. In the case of, so why do we care about computer-assisted proof? So one of the things we care about is proof of spectral stability of nonlinear waves. So for a lot of systems, proving nonlinear stability because of theorems in the literature comes down to showing that you have spectral stability, that you have no eigenvalues in the right half complex plane of an ODE eigenvalue problem. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons why we, we care so much about this because it's the last, sort of the last piece in proving completely rigorously stability of a traveling wave solution. Uh, so as, as we mentioned, there are the Friedland-Wenzel and ansari majlov functionals that give you information about most probable escape paths in stochastic ODE systems. And in this picture, we're showing various paths for the Hamiltonian ODE. So it's, it's giving you an idea of where the minimum will be. So the red here corresponds to conjugate points. If you have a conjugate point, that path is not a minimum for your functional. Um, and we'll talk more about that later, but that's again, one of the motivations. And then optimal control is closely related to calculus of variations. So I see it as being another area where this could be applied in the future. And as I previously mentioned, we're interested in it for wildfire uh, research and applications related to wildfire control. Okay, so I'd, I wanna get more into the details now. Let's talk a little bit about the noise-induced tipping. And, and this is um, to provide some of the setup in this scenario. Then we'll provide a little bit of the setup in the scenario where we're looking at traveling wave solutions. And then we'll get into the actual strategy for rigorous computation for the example of a traveling wave solution. So here we've got, uh, we've got the periodics. This is the inverted van der Waal system that we talked about earlier. So we've got here a periodic orbit. This is in phase space. So X and Y are the components of the ODE system. And then in green and black, we have four heteroclinic connections between the stable fixed point at zero and the uh, periodic orbit here. Um, and, and I should mention this is a, this picture is a courtesy of Emmanuel, so uh, thank you. So here we've, um, we've got two of these that are stable. They alternate between stable and unstable, uh, meaning that two of them correspond to minimums of the Friedland-Wenzel functional and two of them do not. So in the vanishing noise limit, the most probable escape path for your noisy ODE will be along the heteroclinics that are minimum of the Friedland-Wenzel functional. So what happens is these heteroclinic connections converge to the periodic orbit as time goes to infinity. So in this picture, you can see them wrapping around closer and closer to the periodic. And what happens is that some of your flow in the Hamiltonian system that is near a periodic, some of it we observe goes back in towards the center and some of it gets close enough to the periodic orbit and then leaves. Those correspond to, um, those correspond to local minimum if they're if they have no conjugate points and that provides some interesting information okay so as we mentioned one of the heteroclinics is or two of them are stable and two are unstable so the stable ones if you uh, this this path um, what we're looking at here tells you whether or not you have a conjugate point so if this curve passes through zero then you have a conjugate point so this top one corresponds to an unstable heteroclinic, you've got a conjugate point that occurs prior to, um, let's see, this is for the heteroclinic. So it just, it's going to have this periodic behavior because it's wrapping around the periodic orbit. And then this one's stable because it never crosses. Now, what this is showing us is, is the Maslow index. So the number of times we cross is given by the Maslow index. 
um, which it, by the way is computed using the tools you use to compute stability of traveling waves to look at spectral stability of a traveling wave. So again, these are very closely related. These problems, it turns out, are very closely related. OK, so in this picture, we show the uh, um, we show the paths of the Hamiltonian system. And so it's along these paths that we're looking for a minimum in order to get the most probable escape path. And again, most of these pictures I'm showing are, are with uh, courtesy of collaborators on this project. Um, so here we're showing you another view of, of this uh, heteroclinic connection that approaches the periodic. And then some of the paths will, will cross it in the xy plane. And when they do, because they're along the unstable manifold, they will quickly diverge uh, mostly from the periodic. Um, and so the, so the uh, Monte Carlo simulations with the noisy, with the stochastic ODE system indicate in compare when we compare them, and we'll show this in a minute, when we compare them with these minimal paths, these uh, minimums of the functional, friedland wenzel functional or, or nash lafon sager functional, that they, uh, they uh, have some, some that have no conjugate points, that they're their actual minimum that come up to this border. And so they represent most probable escape paths, it would seem. Okay, so I, I think we already saw this picture and, and described it, but here you can see the red corresponding to paths that have conjugate points. And then you can see along it a little bit of the black curves that don't have conjugate points yet. So they correspond to minimum of the functionals we've mentioned. Uh, so this is a really nice picture. It's showing one of these predicted most probable escape paths based on finding the minimum of the functional. And then here is a density map showing where the realizations of the stochastic ODE that escape actually escape. And so you can see this very nice correlation between the predicted most probable escape path and where the noisy paths are actually exiting the periodic. So if you uh, take the Jacobian of the Euler-Lagrange equations, then you get a first order ODE system and you can set it up as a Riccati equation and then no conjugate points corresponds to that Riccati, the solution to that Riccati equation being non-singular. And that in turn, you can evaluate via a Maslow index. So this is all very similar to what you would do for a traveling wave problem. So I want to get a little bit into um, how we do this because it also relates to the rigorous numerics that I'll talk about in a second for the other example. So one key point of this is to, and I know many, if not all here are very familiar with this method. It's just a, an incredible method, right? The parameterization method. So you have here this fixed point zero, and what you do is parameterize the unstable manifold corresponding to that fixed point, because if you have a most, um, if you have a minimum of the functional, it needs to connect the origin, this fixed point zero, to the periodic, and so your solution needs to be part of the unstable manifold of the fixed point zero. And so what we do is obtain a parameterization. Basically, you're using a series representation of the solution where your basis elements are scaled appropriately so that they correspond to the local dynamics at the fixed point. And that is what is shown in this picture. So the idea is that near the fixed point here in phase space, you're going to parameterize the unstable manifold. And then a path 
going from the fixed point to some other point here would correspond to this path here on the unstable manifold. So it's sort of a conjugacy that you're setting up between flow in the system and flow on the unstable manifold. I'll talk a little bit more about that in our next in this example here. Okay, so now let's move to looking at stability of traveling waves. Now that we've talked about some of the motivation and how it applies to the similarities between some other applications, we want to now focus on the computer system proof part. So we'll be doing this for this system here. This is a nonlinear diffusive dispersive equation of Berger's type. Here, x is in the real numbers. t is greater than or equal to 0. u is a real valued function. l, the linear operator l, can be defined via a Fourier multiplier as follows, where uh, it's for some function l. And we assume also that the real part of L evaluated k is less than or equal to 0. And that's so that we get this negative semi-definite condition on a certain integral. And then we give initial data at time t equals 0. And then the solution approaches plus or minus 1. So we'll be doing this for Berger's equation for KDV Berger's. So here we've got the profile. So the traveling wave solution, a stationary solution of this PDE. We're going to look at stability. Um, it turns out with these assumptions uh, that that you can actually look at a Riccati equation. So we have a, a couple more things to consider. Um, So we need a few technical assumptions here. And then it turns out that if you have those, showing stability is equivalent to showing that there's some epsilon such that you only have one bound state of uh, only one eigenvalue of this OD eigenvalue problem um, in a certain half plane. Now, uh, I should mention that this stability that you show is for any size perturbation, which is nice. It's not for just a small perturbation, but for any size perturbation. OK, so if we have our assumptions met, then what the theorem says is that in certain norms, you get convergence so of your perturbation back to a translate of the solution. So what we're going to focus on is how to show that you have just one bound state. Again, this is going to be done for the example system KDV Burgers. So we have for our linear operator L this dispersive term. And nu is a parameter that for showing stability, we'll consider nu between 0.25 up to about point uh, about 4.08. That's where, where the method is no longer able to show stability, though we expect stability to continue for nu greater than that. So it turns out an equivalent problem, you can set this up as an equivalent problem, which is just showing that there exists only one bound state of this equation here, uh, this Riccati equation. And so that's what we'll be looking at is getting a rigorous enclosure of the profile solution and of the solution to this Riccati equation and showing that it only has one bound state. So here that we're showing that, so that corresponds to u sub x crossing 0 once, exactly once. Then you have stability, whereas if u sub x crosses twice, which can happen if this comes back up, then you do not, you're not able to show stability. The method doesn't, uh, the method fails to show stability in that case. <clears throat> Excuse me for a minute. So how do we do this? Uh, again, to many here, this is probably very familiar. So the main idea is to solve for the solution to the ODE in certain pieces, sort of locally, or near, or um, 
near infinity using representations of the unstable and stable manifold with parameterization method. And then to show that you have a solution that exists uh, by piecing together those, those bits of solutions in a certain neighbor, that, that you have a solution within a close neighborhood of that using the Newton Kantorovich argument. So the idea is that you've got some function capital F and an approximate zero of capital F, X bar, um, for the Newton Kantorovich argument, and you want to show that a zero of F is close to X bar. And so you find a approximation. And, and this is just any approximation that you want to use. As long as it works, it works. So you find an approximation A dagger of the Jacobian of F, and then A is an approximate inverse to A dagger, and then you find certain bounds. So you, in your norm, find these bounds on your approximate inverse times F evaluated at your, your guess to this um, zero. You look at how close A and A dagger are to the identity, um, the product of A and A dagger are to the identity. You look at this condition on the um, Jacobian and your approximate Jacobian and its inverse. And then finally, you've got this condition that has to do with a small neighborhood of X bar. So you're trying to show, for example, that your zero is within radius R of X bar. And so you've got to get this, this bound here. But what you typically do is Taylor expand DF so that in the end, you're looking at something that will be on the order of R squared here. And so it's, it's a, something that's not so difficult to get a rigorous bound on with computer-assisted proof, interval arithmetic, computations, et cetera, that's small enough to give you a result. And then if there, if this uh, P of R, this, um, this function of R is negative for some R, then your zeros lie within the radius R of X bar. So what we need to do is form our numerical approximation of the solution to the profile and to the Riccati equation as a function f. Now this newton kantorovich argument does work for an infinite dimensional function, but we're going to take f to be uh, have a finite domain, finite dimensional domain. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to use the parameterization method to represent the manifold, the un unstable manifold corresponding to negative infinity of the profile. And then we're going to get a, use the parameterization method to get a, um, a representation of the stable manifold of both the profile and Riccati equation corresponding to positive infinity. And then we're going to show a condition. There's a condition we can show that you've gone far enough that there are no bound states to the left of this point here at zero. Um, because of non-autonomous, because the system's non-autonomous, we can always take this left point to be x equals zero. So we do. So you show that you've gone far enough here, and then you just use a series representation of the solution in a standard polynomial basis here in between at, at these different nodes to advance the solution forward a little bit, and then use the newton kantorovich argument to tie these together by saying that if you advance the solution, it needs to match the solution at the next point. So our function becomes the advance of our solution, the push forward of our solution minus the next value. And so if that's zero, for all of these, it corresponds to you having a solution to the profile equation connecting your two fixed points and to the Riccati equation. And the Riccati equation asymptotically approaches one, zero on the right. And then on the left, again, we have a condition that says we've gone far enough. So that's the setup. So here we're looking at that same thing in phase space for the profile. So again, you've got your parameterization of the unstable manifold that gets you to this first red dot. And then you have a parameterization of the right manifold. And then these red dots correspond to your um, points in between where you find a series solution to push forward to the next point. 
Uh, one thing that's helpful in what we're doing is to use analytic interpolation of the parameter new. And I will describe that more. But the idea is, so we can use this newton Kantorovich argument, pretty straightforward to use it for a single value of new. And then what do you do when you want to show it for a whole interval of new values and not just a single interval with um, epsilon value of new. So we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, so this parameter, I mentioned this parameterization, oops, sorry. I uh, mentioned this parameterization of the right manifold. So the onsots is that you have a series representation, but you use a certain basis. And that basis for the right manifold here consists of E um, of mu one X where mu one is the eigenvalue and mu two is the other eigenvalue corresponding to your fixed point at positive infinity that are stable. So they have negative real part. So the real part is negative. And then um, what, this, what this does essentially is it makes it so that as X goes to infinity, that you're approaching your phi zero zero term, which is the fixed point. And if you take the derivative and look at it, that you get, you recover the eigenvectors. So that's how you initialize this. You initialize the phi zero zero with the fixed point. You initialize the first two directions, phi zero one, phi one zero with the eigenvectors corresponding to the eigenvalues here. And then that, that um, makes it so that that you're approaching the fixed point and you are along the stable manifold. So as long as these converge, you found a solution that gets you from some finite value, like this red point here, all the way back to positive, all the way to positive infinity. So then we've got to show convergence of this series. We obtain the recursion formula, and then we show convergence by a proof by induction using computer assisted proof. So we show analytically the inductive step, which just comes by, by a little bit of analysis on how big this VMN term is in your recursion formula. And then uh, the effect of this convolution that you get. So then you have a lot of base cases though. And rather than try to do it by hand, you use interval arithmetic to compute these base cases and show that the inductive hypotheses hold. We do something similar for the left manifold. The right manifold was, uh, the, uh, the stable manifold is two dimensional because we're looking at a four dimensional system because now we have the profile and the Riccati equation. For the left manifold, all we need is the profile, the manifold for the profile, and it's a one dimensional manifold. It corresponds to a saddle point. So again, you find the recursion formula. And in this case, we can actually show completely analytically a bound on phi n using a proof by induction. That's very similar to what I just described other than you don't have to use computer assisted proof. And then you've got a geometric series um, to use to bound the tail end there. So the tail end of your geometric series is a bound for the tail end of your series solution. And then you do a similar game in the middle uh, for these points to go from one point to the other, it's just that now you're using a standard polynomial basis. And again, you use a proof by induction to bound the tail end and show that you got convergence, so that you actually have a solution to the ODE. And then when you get all these pieces, you use the newton kantorovich argument, as we've mentioned, to, to tie them all together and prove that you've got, it, that there exists a solution in a small neighborhood of your X bar, which X bar consists of your guess at the solution at these various points. And then a guess at the uh, parameters in your parameterization of the um, manifold at negative infinity and positive infinity. And I should mention one of the nice things about this is, is just that, that not only are we showing a rigorous small, like 10 to the negative eight, 
a rigorous small air bound on the solution, but we're getting existence at the same time. So we're proving that a profile exists and that the, yeah, so that, that's one of the other advantages of this method. Okay, so what's our approach for finding a, a, a way to get a good enclosure of the solution for lots of values of new, not just for a single epsilon machine interval width value of, of new. So to do that, we use analytic interpolation of the coefficients for these various series solutions. And then you can use the Newton-Kantorovich argument. And by using this, this analytic interpolation of the coefficients, you're, you're able to apply the Newton-Kantorovich argument to every value of new but you sort of do it all at the same time using these interpolations of the coefficients. So uh, analytic interpolation, this is a, a result by Tadmore and Reddy and Weidemann that is extremely helpful. So here we've got an analytic function f. f is analytic inside and on some stadium or ellipse here in the complex plane. And then we're trying to interpolate the function f along this piece of the real line negative one to one using Chebyshev nodes. So these red dots correspond to Chebyshev nodes. And then up here, we've got the function evaluated in this example, evaluated those Chebyshev nodes. So what you do is show that your function f is analytic inside and on some ellipse that encloses negative one to one. You can always, uh, use a linear coordinate change so that you're on negative one to one. And then uh, you get a bound on the modulus of f evaluated along this ellipse. So that's what this blue curve here corresponds to. It's the modulus of f evaluated along the ellipse. And you use that in this nice bound and we've left off a few of the details, but the important thing is that it basically looks like m row this bound this upper bound on the modulus of f evaluated on this ellipse, divided by rho to the n. Rho tells you the size of your ellipse. Rho is greater than one. And so this, de um, this uh, decays to zero at exponential rate as the number of Chebyshev nodes, capital N, goes uh, to infinity. So it's, it's incredible. You get this exponential decay of, of error. In our case, we can show that as long as we don't take rho too large, the coefficients of our various series solutions are indeed analytic for an ellipse. And so we're able to, to do um, an ongoing work we're doing analytic interpolation. So we've got it working completely for a single value of nu, and we've got computer system proof of that. And then we're getting close to having it for whole intervals of nu. So one, uh, just a, a few things to mention when you're looking at problems of this type. Because, we're, so we're using IntLab as our interval arithmetic package, which is a great package. It changes the rounding mode on the machine in order to enclose computations with an upper and lower bound as it's doing this interval arithmetic. And changing the rounding mode on the computer is extremely expensive. And so you want to use vectorization if using IntLab, because then you don't have to change the rounding mode as often. And with these type of rigorous computations, you really have to work at getting efficiency because, because of, of this issue. And so, uh, so optimization of your code is very important. One of the ways that you can do that is this use of analytic interpolation. Because it converges at exponential rate, that really helps you cut down on, on the number of computations you have to do, because then you're just computing at a few of these nodes, and then you don't have the wrapping effect. This, um, if you take your, your parameter intervals too large, then as your computation progresses, your interval enclosure grows so large that it's useless. You're not able to, to say anything about what you want to say. Um, so that's another nice thing. We use analytic interpolation to not to compute not actually for each coefficient, but for the sum of the coefficients. We, we truncate our series solutions at a certain index, and we bound the error for the remaining terms, the tail end, and then we use analytic interpolation on the sum of those 
finite number of coefficients. And that is more, much more cost effective than trying to interpolate each coefficient and then adding together those interpolants. And then you have to use careful choice of where to evaluate manifolds, step size, et cetera. I mean, anyone that's that's done this stuff knows what I'm talking about, that uh, there's it, there's an art and and a, it, it's quite a bit of work, quite a bit more work to do computer assisted proof than just using double arithmetic. Um, so efficiency is very important. So where to go from here? So for the specific problem of computer assisted proof I was talking about, it's to study, it's to finish the study. So we've done new for uh, several values of new for single points throughout this interval here. We want to, we're extending it in the process of extending it now to the entire interval via the Sandalic interpolation, which I should mention we've used successfully in the past in other computer assisted proof applications. And, and um, everything just works so nicely when you do it that way. Uh, so it would be interesting to study stability for new greater than 4.15. That's going to require a different approach because our method doesn't work for new greater than that, but we do believe it to be stable beyond that. We, um, as mentioned earlier on, one of my interests is in identifying most probable escape paths and dynamical systems. And this is an area too where, where for physical problems, it could be very interesting to have a rigorous enclosure uh, or, or to rigorously prove that you found a minimum of the functional that corresponds to the thing you're trying to show. And then uh, the long-term goal is to continue to use these in proving stability of traveling waves and other models and, and identifying most probable escape paths and dynamical systems etc for systems that are physically motivated that model something of interest well thank you very much all right uh everybody let's thank blake barker for this uh, wonderful talk and uh, also thank you for capping this um, workshop seminar series for us before we start with the questions, um, so we want to thank everyone for 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 attending, and we want to thank all the speakers um, and also all the organizers as well. Uh, we had a, a lot of great speakers, and um, thank you again. So, um, before we start with the questions, um, Blake, thank you. Um, 